Hello all, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale radio controlled ArmorTech M4A4 Sherman tank. Since the last video update, the models, sprockets, and idlers have been assembled and installed. We'll be going over what it takes to assemble and install these components in this video. As for the sprockets, the sprockets have the following layout. You have the center sprocket hub, a cover hubcap plate, a taper lock, and the sprocket teeth. All these components, with the exception of the brush lock, are fabricated out of aluminum. Either CNC turned aluminum billet or water jetted or possibly laser cut aluminum for the sprocket teeth. Their assembly is all bolt together construction and assembles very easily. The sprocket teeth in particular are extremely nicely done in that they have their very intricate pattern to them which is replicated in 1 6 scale. The teeth themselves are almost the exact same design in the way they mount to the hub as they are on the real Sherman tank. The taper brush lock it comes in a little plastic cup that contains both the two fasteners for securing the block to the sprocket. In addition to the taper lock, the piece also comes with a square piece of steel which is used as the key to lock every to lock the taper lock to the drive spindle on the final drive. ArmorTech is one of the few companies to have their radio control tank kit with sprockets that are designed in this format in that the hub is separate from the gear teeth or the sprocket teeth. All the other 1-6 scale radio control tanks that are on the market, either the ones imported from Russia or even the Vantex or Fulian, has their sprocket as molded as one piece like this here. Having the pieces separate offer a few advantages. First of all, it's more prototypical as in that it's just like the real tank. And the second thing is that, for maintenance reasons, it's also a lot better. If for ever reason you need to replace the sprocket teeth, either they wear out or you had some kind of an accident and the teeth ring got broken, it's easy to switch out the bolts to change out the sprocket teeth like on the real tank as opposed to trying to track down and replace the entire sprocket itself if it was molded. If I need a replacement Sherman tooth, I simply call up ArmorTech and with their great customer service, they send me a new one right away. This is not just true for their Sherman, but also for their other tanks, including their Panther, as well as their Tiger and King Tigers. And here we have a sprocket that's been completed with the, and having its teeth rings mounted to it. The sprockets themselves are almost identical to the ones from their first generation release. In fact, the parts are more than likely interchangeable. One thing that is different is that the material of the teeth rings have changed. On the original M4A3 release, these here were made out of laser cut steel. And on this release, like I mentioned before, they're made out of aluminum. The material of these aluminum sprockets is more than durable enough to hold up for the use of the track links that are used on this model. For the track links, they are made out of die cast metal and these, the same material which was used on these sprockets is the same exact material that ArmorTech uses on all of their other tanks including their King Tiger, Tiger One, as well as their Panther. I've put uh, equal amount of mileage on those models as well and I haven't noticed any track wear on any of these vehicles. So the material that's used on these sprockets is more than adequate for the job at hand. When it comes to assembling sprockets, one area of concern is making sure that the two teeth are lined up perfectly. If we notice, even though the parts are all CNC made and designed on a computer, the holes are a little bit larger than that on the drum itself. This is normal. Because of this, if you just simply tighten all the bolts on one side and then on the other side, the pieces can be off by a small little fraction. This small little fraction can cause the track to not ride on the timing perfectly and can lead to not only sprocket wear, but it can also lead to track derailment. 
a common trick that I do on all of my tanks from 116 to 135, and even 16, is I to make sure that the timing is aligned perfectly, I assemble a small section of track. The amount of track that I assemble is enough to circle around the sprocket so that it creates a closed loop. When I'm bolting on the ring, I only bolt on four holes and I leave the holes purposely loose. As you can see, there's still some play with the sprocket teeth. It is at this point here when I thread on the track. I make sure it's all nice and tight. By threading on the track, the track will act as a jig and will automatically line up the two teeth perfectly so that the track timing matches perfectly with the sprocket teeth. Once the pieces are threaded on, you can then tighten the bolts to the proper tightness and not have to worry about them moving on you. You do the same procedure on both sides. Once the teeth are tight, you can remove the track. The piece is nice and steady, it's nice and even, and now you can go ahead and put on the rest of the bolts. You can also put the rest of the bolts on while the track is still threaded around the sprocket if you so desire. Moving our way to the model's rear idler wheels, the idler wheel itself, just like the main road wheel, is comprised out of a single piece aluminum CNC turning. Turning itself appears to be made out of a billet rod of aluminum. The wheel itself is very strong and is very durable. The wheel pattern is just like the Sherman's road wheels, which is the pressed steel variant of the return roller. Unlike the main road wheels, the rear idler wheel features not only the front, but rear detailing. The wheel itself is nicely done, and like I mentioned, is a solid piece and can take years of, of use. Also, unlike the road wheels, the idler wheel actually has the two little divots that are integrally milled into the road wheel for, the, for that of the Zerk fittings. Just like the road wheel, it also has the tooling marks from the machining process. These marks are found on both sides. Here goes a road wheel that I went ahead and reworked. The tool marks have all been buffed away with some sandpaper. And in addition to buffing away the tool marks, I also went ahead and I enlarged the Zerk fitting wells. After the wells were enlarged, the fittings themselves were fitted to their locations. This is done to both the front and rear portions of the vehicle. In aiding me in having to remove the tooling marks, rather than going in there with a hand piece of emery cloth or sandpaper and buffing down each spoke, I went ahead and utilized the Dremel. The, for the attachment, I went ahead and utilized the sandpaper cutting disc that I have here. The sandpaper cutting disc affixed to the Dremel's cutting stone mandrel in the same exact fashion. The only difference is that instead of the disc itself being made out of a hard, rigid, either ceramic or fiberglass disc, they are made out of paper. The pieces now are somewhat, these sanding discs are somewhat tricky to find. However, here goes the catalog number right here. If I can get that into focus. There we have the catalog number in which you could purchase these, these pieces from Sears Direct. The advantage about the sanding disc is that Unlike a cutting stone in which it's rigid, the paper actually flexes and contours the tricky angles of the wheel spokes. After a few swipes with the disc, the tool marks are completely buffed down as such. Once this wheel has its tooling marks removed, both wheels will be heading into priming, painting, and then will be installed to the vehicle. After the model sprockets are assembled, they get their primer and base coat of olive drab. Once all those coats of paint are dry, it is then time to affix the sprocket to the vehicle. 
Now, like on all Armor Tech tanks, the sprockets are held onto the drive axle via a taper brush lock. Like I mentioned in another one of my Armor Tech build videos, the taper brush lock is a very effective way at keeping the sprocket on the spindle and works very well. As for installation, Armortech gives you a very nice detailed set of instructions along with photographs in order to assemble the taper brush lock properly. Once the sprocket is installed, the sprocket will be able to pivot freely. This is going to be obviously until the installation of the gearbox. As you can see from rotating the sprocket, it is on nice and true and does not have any wobble or canter to it while the sprocket is rotating. Also, if we notice, it doesn't make any contact with the final drive and everything runs nice and smooth. As for alignment, one trick that I like to use on all of my ArmorTech builds when I'm aligning the sprocket to the, to the model is that you need to adjust the width of the sprocket so that the track properly connects to the road wheel and is all nice and squared away. If not, in the, if the sprocket is on slightly exposed too much, what will happen is that the track will be off-centered and can derail on you while the tank is in motion. Happening, what, like I also mentioned in another video, I assemble a small little section of track. The purpose of this track is I line it up with the road wheel and then I hook it onto the sprocket when I'm adjusting the sprocket and fitting it onto the drive axle. I then carefully make sure that everything is nice and squared away. Once everything is squared away, I can then go ahead and tighten the taper lock as per the instructions. By doing so, the wheel and the sprocket match perfectly with their alignment and there will be there should be no issues once the model is road tested. The last bit of detail that needs to be added to the sprocket is that of the detail hubcap. Just like with their German tanks, Armatex supplies you with a CNC aluminum hubcap that fits over this section here, thus covering up the faceplate of the taper lock. On their Sherman, fixing the hubcap differs from that on their German tanks in that on the German tanks, the hubcap simply gets epoxied or glued to the rim of the sprocket. While on the Sherman series that Armortech has, this is facilitated by a countersunk bolt. The bolt goes into this location here and threads directly into the pre-drilled and pre-tapped hole in the center of the main final drive gear. This design is a direct carryover from their previous M4A3 release and does have several benefits to it. First benefit is that while by covering up the taper lock it prevents any dirt and debris from getting inside. Second benefit is that the Sherman tank is supposed to have its hubcap detailing on this location over here. And the third benefit is that because of the way it, it fixes to the sprocket via the countersunk bolt, once installed it keeps everything it helps everything stay together as one piece at its proper location. The hubs themselves will be affixed to the sprockets permanently after the model has a successful test run. More on that is to follow. Just like with the other suspension components on these Armortech tanks, the rear the rear idler mount needs to be primed and painted before installation. Just like on my other builds, I always protect the axle portions of the mounts with masking tape prior to the piece going into paint. Once the piece is painted, the tape is removed and is ready for installation. Just like on my other builds, on the axles, I always like to apply a very thin film of grease to the axle, which goes ahead and helps it with not only the installation, but also with the actual adjustment of the idler once it's installed. And furthermore, it also, like I always mentioned, protects the steel from any type of corrosion that can happen over time. Once the thin film is added, the piece is ready for installation. One quick tip before the installation of the idler mount. On the steel plate that secures and mounts the idler mount to the idler shaft, there is a small little star that is laser cut into the steel. The star is a nice feature and it is designed to lock into this little square piece here that's found on the shaft. When these pieces are fresh out of the bag, they the, the fitting and fit are very, very tight. To help with having the piece fit on better, I go ahead with a needle file before the piece is painted and I simply just make a few passes on all the flat square surfaces 
just, just so it gives me enough space for the piece to fit on a little bit more smoothly. You gotta be careful in that you don't want to over sand the part with the file. You just want to have remove enough material so the piece fits on without the use of any tools. Once you have that type of fitting acquired, you could then prime, paint the pieces, and install everything once complete. The mounts themselves are very easy to install, and I will be doing it in real time. We first take our idler shaft and slide it into the idler mount. Once the shaft is in the idler mount, I then position on the retention block or square. Simply snaps on. Now you could adjust it to whichever orientation works best for you. The purpose is that you will secure the mount to the idler shaft via a hex bolt or a cap screw that once tightened down will prevent the piece from rotating. The orientation depends on your track tension which will be needed to be set once the track is assembled. So for right now I will leave it in this format here and adjust it later on. Once the plate is put in the position that you desire, you then uh, secure the plate to the idler shaft via this brass hex bolt, which if we notice has also been painted. This piece here simply threads on and it's easy to affix via a ratchet. And once tightened, the piece is now ready for its, road, for its idler wheel to be mounted. Moving our way to the rear idler wheel installation. The rear idler wheel, since the last scene, have had their primer and base coat added. And if we notice, I went ahead and weathered and added the red Zerk fitting details to the interior portion of the road wheel. As we, ha as we can see here. The purpose for adding the weathering to this portion of the row wheel, like I mentioned in my other videos, is because once these pieces are affixed to the model, this visible area will be very difficult to get to with the airbrush with all the other mounting bracket machinery in the way. So prior to assembly, I go ahead and paint this now as to save some time later on in the build. Just like on the other Armor Tech models, the rear idler wheels themselves ride on ball bearings. The kit supplied ball bearings fit directly into the ball bearing slots which are machined directly into the idler wheels themselves. Bearings at make for a very smooth running model as there is very little friction on the wheels themselves. Installation of the rear idler wheel is a very simple and straightforward process. Prior to installation of the wheel I went ahead and added a quick smear grease to the axle itself. Just like I mentioned in my other videos, when you're adding lubrication, you only want to add a quick little smear, but you don't want to get any grease on the front face here of the axle. Because of the way the lock bolt threads in, any grease or lubrication could potentially interfere with the thread lock and not give you a good enough bond, which will in turn let the screw possibly get loose on you while the tank is in motion. The wheel itself simply slides onto the axle via the bearings and to affix the wheel to the mount permanently that is facilitated with a countersunk bolt. In addition to the bolt there is a small CNC steel little retention disc. This disc will, once screwed on, will prevent the wheel from sliding off. You simply put that screw into the disc, add a smear of thread lock to the fastener, and then thread it on to the axle as such. Tighten the piece with an Allen wrench. After the fastener is tightened, the wheel will still be able to spin nice and smoothly and will not be able to come out. It is then at this point you can go ahead and add on the hubcap detailing to the rear idler wheel. For the hubcap, the kit supplies you with two CNC machined aluminum hubcaps.
the pieces are fully machined and fit on perfectly to the model. The pieces also have their fastener holes drilled out for the builder to insert small fasteners for that of the fastener detail. Now, instead of using the kit supplied aluminum hubcap, I went ahead and substituted that with one of my own resin Sherman hubcaps, which are found on the EastCoastArmory.com product line. The hubcaps, to make it fit the ArmorTech wheel, I went ahead and machined the interface of the hubcap to match that of the ArmorTech one. With the piece beveled out, I go ahead and just simply super glue it to the idler and the hubcap detail will be complete. With the piece installed, as you can see it's a perfect match for the ArmorTech idler. As for the hubcaps themselves, I the only paint that I added to them at the moment is that of their primer gray. The base coat Evolve Drab will be added to them when the rest of the model receives its base coat. More on that is to come. After the installation of the sprockets and the idlers, I went ahead and flipped the hull upside down to add the airbrush weathering to the bottom plate. The reason why I did this procedure at this point of the build is because after this point the model will become much too heavy as well as much more fragile to go ahead and put on its back like this to add this weathering. Keep in mind, after this point, the model will receive not only its electronics, but also its superstructure components and details. So it is a lot more viable to do the airbrush weathering at this point of the build. With the addition of the sprocket and the idlers, this completes the running gear portion of this build. The next phase that the model will be heading into will be that of getting the model operational by adding all of the electronics and machinery. That phase of the build will be discussed in the next video update. And that concludes this project update video for this 1-6 scale ArmorTech radio controlled M4A4 Sherman tank. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook. And don't forget to stop by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1-6 scale tank builds as well as other 1-6 scale detail components. Thank you.